Hi friends, here is a very interesting interview question that is often asked to data scientist roles at good product based companies and startups. And we know that a question very similar to this has been asked at companies like Amazon. Uh, the question might look too simple, but don't fall for the trap. Don't fall into the trap of it. And uh, the question is from basic probability theory, right? So the question is what percentage of values lie between mean and one standard deviation? When they say one standard deviation, both on the positive side and on the negative side of mean, right? Very simple looking question. So my suggestion to you is please, again, this question is often considered as an easy question, right? At product based companies. So please try to pause this video now and try to answer it before you, uh, before you listen to the rest of the discussion and solution for this specific problem. Okay, so I'm assuming that you have spent some time trying to answer this question and a very common answer that we have seen a lot of students give or a lot of even data scientists give is approximately 68% of points lie between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma, right? So if you take this interval, right? In this interval, because this is one standard deviation away from mean, on the negative side, this is one standard deviation away from the mean on the positive side, right? So in this interval, many people very commonly answered uh, number is approximately 68%. But here, the reason this question was asked at a product based company is because, again, this question is intentionally left ambiguous. They have not told you what is the distribution of data. Like if you see the question above, right? If you see the question above, they just asked you what percentage of values lie between mean and one standard deviation. And many people who answered actually 68% assumed that the data is Gaussian distributed or normally distributed, right? So the interviewer can now say, nobody told you it's not necessarily true. Again, this 68% answer is not necessarily true if the data is non-Gaussian. This question is intentionally left ambiguous because the interviewer is expecting you to ask follow-up questions. Like a good follow-up question here is, hey, you're talking about the number of values between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma, but is the data Gaussian distributed? That's a good follow-up question to ask, right? That's a very good follow-up question to ask. And if you have not asked it, then you're making assumptions that the data is Gaussian distributed. Now the interviewer can say, okay, 68, approximately 68% is true if the data is Gaussian. So they can just go ahead and say, what if the data is non-Gaussian? This is a good follow-up question again. This is a very good follow-up question where they're saying, what if the data is non-Gaussian? Now, can you say something about what percentage of values lie between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma? This is now a good follow-up. Again, please pause this video and try to answer this question on your own before you see the rest of the discussion. Again, in a lot of product-based companies, in a lot of good interviews, you see this nice sequence of follow-up questions one after the other to see and to understand your thought process, right? So please tackle this and I'll explain the solution or I'll, I'll try to answer this question in just a minute or so. Okay, so if you have tried to tackle it, one, one simple way to tackle this is using something called a Sebyshev's inequality, a very, very popular inequality in basic probability theory, right? What this inequality says is this, probability here x is a random variable, mu is its mean, sigma is its variance and k is any value that is greater than zero. Right. So what it says, what it literally tells us is probability of absolute value of x minus mu greater than or equal to k sigma is less than or equal to 1 by k square. So what it what it's telling you, if you try, if you want to visualize this uh, geometrically, it's suppose this is your number line, this all the values that x can take. Let's assume this is your mu minus x and this is your mu plus x. So what it's telling you is that suppose if you have k equals to, let's say 1. Okay, that's what it is in our case, right? In our case, we care about one standard deviation away. So let's assume k equals to one. Then what this equation is telling you is that the number of values which lie, which, which lie in this region and the number of values that lie in this region, if you sum them up, because if you see, if your x takes this value, it is at a distance greater than, sorry, I should write sigma here. I'm sorry, not x. This is sigma. My bad. So the number of so if, you, if, if, you're, if let's assume you have, a, you have taken a sample, let's say x1, and the sample value is here, right? Then what happens? x1 minus mu will be greater than k, 1 sigma. Let's assume k equals to 1 here, right? Then what it's literally telling you is the probability 
that you'll see values in this region and in this region together is less than or equal to 1 by k square. Now in our case, again, very popular inequality. We have described this in a lot of detail. We have had some interview questions based on Chebyshev's inequality in our course videos also. So if you know Chebyshev's inequality, this is a very simple problem to tackle. There is a small trick here, but I'll come to that. So what we want is one standard deviation in our original question. So if you plug k equals to 1, this becomes 1, this also becomes 1. So what do you get? You get, you get an inequation like this, right? What is this saying? This is saying the probability of observing points that are farther than one standard deviation, which means this region and this region. The probability of observing points in this region and in this region together, that probability is less than or equal to 1. If that probability is less than or equal to 1, what are we looking for? We are looking for probability of observing values in this region between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. That's what we are looking for. Now, if the probability of observing points in this region plus in this region is less than or equal to 1, then all that we can say here is the probability of observing points in this middle region now is greater than or equal to 0. You can't say anything better than this. So, one genuine answer if you're not making any assumptions about the distribution of data is you might observe greater than or equal to 0% of points and obviously less than or equal to 100% of values can lie in this interval that you have asked. Of course, if the data is Gaussian distributed, then approximately 68% of points will lie between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. But if no information is given about the distribution, this is a more appropriate answer because you can't pinpoint a specific number without knowing the underlying distribution itself, right? Very simple, very simple question. But the catch here is the question is left ambiguous for you to figure out, for you to ask follow-up questions and for you to be smart about applying Sebyshev's inequality and recognizing that the dis underlying distribution is not mentioned. Now, this is not the end of it. A good interviewer can ask you another follow-up question. This is a very nice follow-up question. And this question is at a medium level hardness as far as product-based companies are concerned. Now, this question here is, okay, you use Sebyshev's inequality. Very good. You know about it. Can you give an example where Sebyshev's inequality fails? This is a very good question because this is saying, hey, you use Sebyshev's inequality. Do you really understand Sebyshev's inequality? And if you know it, can you figure out where it fails? Again, please pause this video and try to tackle this question. This question is not trivial. This question requires you to think slightly, uh, play with the Sebyshev's inequality and understand, think of various distributions and see for which sort of distribution Sebyshev's inequality might fail, right? So think about, again, there is no one right answer. There are multiple right answers for this. Okay, cool. Now, I'll, I'll go into the solution, right? So this is your Sebyshev's inequality, right? I, I've just written it here. Now, what if you have a distribution of a random variable x, where x equals to constant? Okay, you have a random variable that only takes one value. Okay, look at this. This is this is your, so let's assume x equals to some constant. Let's assume x is always equals to 1, always equals to 1. Then what happens? Then what is your mu? What is the, what is the mean of this random variable? It will be the same constant c, right? What will be the standard deviation? It will be 0. Because a random variable can only take one value. It cannot take any other value. So how would the, how would the distribution look like if this is the x? It will always take only one value. It cannot take any other value. Right? So this is how this is how the distribution will look like. Again, this is an extreme case of a distribution. This is an ext I agree that this is an extreme case of a distribution, but nonetheless, it's a valid distribution. If let's assume the probability that x takes c equals to 1 and the probability that x is not equals to c is always 0. Let's assume this is th this is a perfectly valid probability distribution, right? Mathematically speaking, this is perfectly valid. And this is how its uh, PDF will look like, right? There's nothing wrong with it. Now, for this sort of extreme distribution, would your Chebyshev's inequality hold? Let's try it. So let's take k equals to 2, which is greater than, again, all we need is k should be greater than 0. So I've taken k equals to 2. Then what happens here? Let's try to plug in. Okay. So again, remember your mu is c, your sigma is 0, right? Your mu equals to c. Cool. So then I will just, if I just plug sigma equals to 0, this becomes 0. If I plug k equals to 2, 1 by 2 square, so this becomes 1 by 4. So now what do I get here? So this became 0. The probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to 0, the absolute value of it obviously is less than or equal to 1 by 4. Now, if you think about it, let's see what this means. 
Let's see what this means. Remember, your random variable x can only take one value, which is a constant. Which means what it's telling you is, look at this, what it's telling you is the probability that x is greater than or equal to mu, right? I mean, you can write this as this, right? Is less than or equal to 1 by 4. But we know that the probability that x is greater than or equal to mu, because there is also this equal to, right? We know that probability that x equals to constant, which is mu, is 1. So, which means the probability that x is greater than or equal to mu, which is equal to c, right, is obviously equals to 1. So, the LHS equals to 1, the RHS equals to 1 by 4. Can 1 be less than or equal to 1 by 4? No, obviously not. So, this is a case where Sebyshev's inequality would fail, right? Very simple example, right? So, if you understand whenever you learn any equalities or any, any machine learning models or any statistical theorems or any concept, try to learn where it fails. That's very, very important because that gives you a better clarity on why things work and where things fail and where not to apply something. So, if you have a distribution like this, Sebyshev's inequality will not work. So, if you see the official definition of Sebyshev's inequality in any standard mathematical textbook or even on Wikipedia, it says Chebyshev's inequality will work if the random variable has a finite mean, a finite and non-zero standard deviation, right? Again, there are some distributions like Pareto distributions which do not have finite mean and finite standard deviation, right? So, I mean, you could, you could have constructed another example of a Pareto distribution which doesn't have a finite mean and even there Chebyshev's inequality will fail, but proving that will be slightly more complicated. The simplest way to to construct an example where Sebyshev's inequality will fail is to take standard deviation equals to zero, which means, imagine if your standard deviation is zero, what does it mean? Your random variable x always takes the same value, which is a constant, obviously. So, Sebyshev's inequality will hold if you have finite mean, finite and non-zero standard deviation and k greater than zero. Again, great interviewers or good interviewers at good companies typically ask you the sequence of follow-up questions to understand your depth of understanding and also they want to understand how deeply you know a concept and how well you know a concept. So they'll start from easy questions, seemingly trivial questions sometimes. This question at the very outset might have looked like a trivial question, but they can easily go from a trivial question to an easy question to a medium question, even to a hard question, right? A hard question here or a slightly harder question that is typically asked for scientists uh, who come from mathematics or statistics background is, Okay, so Sebyshev's inequality also says that we need to have a finite mean. Can you construct distributions which have non-finite mean and prove that Sebyshev's inequality will not apply there? That's typically asked for somebody who has a master's degree or a PhD in statistics, right? So we can go from a seemingly trivial question to a fairly hard question in just two to three questions, right? So the sequence of follow-up questions is a great way that a lot of good interviewers try to follow to see how well and how deep you know concepts.